The loss of about 150 tanks and 1,600 prisoners forced the Americans to surrender, also the important town of Gafsa, which gave us our starting point against the north. Combat groups of the Africa Army and the 5th Panzer Army thrust on at once to the southwest, the west and the north. Large quantities of fuel were captured and the Americans set fire to 30 aircraft on an advanced flying field. My Panzer Reconnaissance Battalion moved up in order to advance north out of the Gafsa area and give the Americans no chance to rest. From Gauss, I heard that Rommel wanted to strike against Tabessa, hence far into the enemy's rear. To the Commando Supremo, however, and also to von Arnim, this seemed too risky. They couldn't and wouldn't follow Rommel's plans. So, orders were given merely to thrust against El Kef, far too close behind the Anglo-American front. During the night of 1819 February, I was given the task of taking the Kasserine Pass in a surprise coup and of holding it for the following units. With the motorcycle escorts in front, I moved off before dawn in the hope of catching the Americans unawares. They were on the alert, however, and straddled us with heavy artillery fire, which was directed by observers stationed on the heights on either side of the way through the pass. I couldn't get through. Neither could a rifle regiment that was sent in against the pass. All the same, we took a few prisoners who belonged to the 34th US Division. We were surprised by the first-class equipment of the men and, most of all, by the daily ration that everyone had on him. It was not just the bar of chocolate, the chewing gum, butter and cigarettes, which, for us, were unaccustomed treats. We were fascinated by the printed slip that was enclosed with each package. On it was written, You are the best paid and best equipped soldier in the world. We have given you the best weapons in the world. Whether you are also the best fighter is now for you to prove. As we very soon discovered, the Americans had first-class tanks and anti-tank guns. Behind the front, large supply dumps could quickly replace any deficiency. The fact that they had no combat experience and were at a disadvantage against our desert foxes could not be held against them. In one respect, they seemed to have the edge over their British allies. They were extraordinarily flexible. They adapted immediately to a changed situation and fought with great doggedness. I will never forget the sight of a few Tiger Panzers with their superior 88 mid to a tank gun, knocking out one Sherman after the other as they tried to advance through a pass to the east and couldn't understand that they were hopelessly inferior to the Tigers. We admired the courage and plan with which the Americans executed their attacks even though we sometimes felt sorry for them at having to pay for their first combat experience with such heavy losses. We discovered later, in Italy, and in the battles in France in 1944, how quickly the Americans were able to evaluate their experience and, through flexible and unconventional conduct of a battle, convert it into results. Our thrust to the north, begun so hopefully, came to a standstill, owing to the false start against El Kef on the one hand and on the other, to inadequate supplies. In addition, after heavy downpours of rain, we made progress only with difficulty, and in the mountain valleys we were straddled, time and again, by enemy artillery. We had to withdraw to the Kasserine Pass, while in the north the 5th Panzer Army started a relief attack which failed to penetrate the Anglo-American resistance. At the end of February, Rommel became commander-in-chief of Army Group Africa, with the residual armies under General Messe in the south and under Colonel General von Arnim in the north. The front was terribly long and could be manned at only a few points. The materiel, especially that of the Americans, was overwhelming. Rommel would now have liked to give up the south of Tunisia and, with the remains of the Army Group, form a strong bridgehead around the city of Tunis, with the Cape Bon Peninsula, in order to start evacuating from there at least a part of the battle-tried Africa army. The plan was rejected. At the beginning of March, I heard from Gauss that Rommel intended flying to Fuera HQ in order to save what there was to save. As I happened to be in reserve, my battalion had hardly any armoured cars or ammunition left. 
I went to Rommel's command post, which was not far away. May I speak to Rommel and say goodbye to him? I asked Gos. Of course, he will be glad to see the commander of his favourite battalion. Rommel sat in his mammoth, as always, with his campaign maps before him. I hadn't seen him for some weeks and was shocked at how unwell he looked. He was visibly weak, suffering from tropical disease and completely worn out. Still, he had that unique sparkle in his eyes. Field Marshal, I have heard that you intend flying to headquarter. From the state of things here, I don't think you will be coming back. As commander of the battalion, which was once the first to land in North Africa and has been allowed to fight every battle with you, may I, in the name of each individual member of my battalion, say goodbye to you till we meet again, sometime, somewhere. We'll hold out here for as long as we can, always after the example you have given us. Rommel stood up. He had tears in his eye. What must have been going on inside this man, who had always been hard on himself and had identified himself with his men and the theatre of war? I had never mentioned these tears to anyone, until, long after the war and my captivity, I met his wife Lucy and told her of her husband's prophecy and of his tears. Rommel's tears, the tears of a great man now cast down, moved me as much as anything I saw in the war. Rommel went to a cupboard on the wall and came back with a large photograph, which showed him as a healthy and successful man. He signed his likeness with a dedication. Here, Luck, take this in gratitude and appreciation of your brave battalion. Keep well. I hope we shall see each other again at home. God be with you. He turned around and I left him, deeply moved. On 9th of March, Rommel flew to Germany. Now everything happened very quickly. Colonel General von Arnim took command of Army Group Africa, supported by General Gauss, the experienced general staff officer in North Africa. While every day anticipating a major offensive by Montgomery against the Mareth position, we grappled with the Americans, who tried to break through from the Atlas Mountains to the coast. We had considerable losses. On 23 March, Monty made a move, and with a tank corps bypassing Mareth, swept over the weak Italian positions. The Mareth line had to be given up. The bulk of the artillery could not be brought back. At Gabes, the remains of the Panzer Army Africa tried once again to establish itself. My battalion had to cover the western flank. Our supply sections had already been transferred to the Cape Bon Peninsula. Then, at the end of March, an order reached me to report at once, in person, to von Arnim. I had no idea what was wanted of me. General Gauss received me. Rommel has gotten nowhere with Hitler. We shall neither receive adequate supplies, nor does the Führer want to know anything about a German Dunkirk. Rommel has been sent for treatment and forbidden to return to Africa as planned. Come, the Commander-in-Chief is expecting you. What did von Arnim want from me? I didn't know him, nor had I ever heard anything about him. A tall, slim man with sharp features awaited me. Here to report, Colonel General, I presented myself. Good to meet you, Luck. I have the pleasure of presenting you in the name of the Duce with the Medaglia d'Argento, a decoration that corresponds roughly to our Knight's Cross. He pinned the order to my chest and handed me the certificate. I was naturally pleased and undoubtedly had my friends of the Nizza Battalion to thank for the decoration. Associated with the order, there was even a small monthly pension and free first-class travel for two on all Italian railways for life. But von Arnim had hardly sent for me because of the order. And then it came. Luck, I have decided, in agreement with Rommel and Gauss, that you will fly at once to Führer headquarter to lay before Hitler and explain a detailed plan for the evacuation of as many elements as possible of the Africa army. For this, you will first fly to Rome and have the plan countersigned, countersigned by Marshal Kesselring. You will then fly on to Berlin and report to Colonel General Guderian, Chief of the General Staff of the Army, and General Schmidt, likewise, for countersigning. You then fly to Berchtesgaden, to Führer Headquarter, and report to Keitel or Jody 
to be given an appointment with Hitler. Wherever you go, you will keep in contact with us through a 1000 watt radio and a special code. General Seidemann, air chief for Africa, whom I knew well, and his wife, Medifraud, from Berlin days, will let you have his Heinkel. Departure as soon as possible. I am honoured by the task, Colonel General, I replied. But how should I, an insignificant frontline soldier, get anywhere with Hitler? Besides, I should like to be with my men in the final phase. We've thought of all that, said von Armin. The army generals are extremely suspect to the Fuhrer. Even Rommel is apparently to be left out in the cold. Even after the loss of Stalingrad, Hitler sticks to his victory or death, but no retreat. That means we shall now lose about 130,000 men in North Africa too, men with the best combat experience and of high morale. Hitler is more likely to listen, if at all, to an insignificant major straight from the front, if you give him a clear idea of the situation and the feeling among the men. You will travel and appear before him in your dusty, faded uniform. That can't fail to have an effect. The plan you are taking was worked out some time ago and provides for the proportional evacuation of the most important officers, frontline soldiers and technicians. General Gores will discuss the details with you. I wish you, and us, complete success. Report daily, by radio. With a shake of the hand, I was dismissed. Gores filled out the mission. You won't be returning to your battalion, but we'll go to the supply base in the Cape Bon Peninsula. There, I'll send you a Fiesler stalk, which will take you to the airfield the day after tomorrow early enough for you to set off before dawn. Kesselring, Guderian and Schmidt have been informed of your coming. I don't know whether you will be allowed to come back to Africa, but try. Speed is of the importance. Every day lost makes evacuation more difficult. All the best, luck. Gors handed me the plan in a large envelope and I was dismissed. I had to stop and take a deep breath. This mission was altogether too unexpected and momentous. After all the years of frontline service, here was a task that went far beyond the level of a battalion commander. It was not all that far to our supply base, and I arrived there shortly before dark. The astonishment was suitably great when I had to tell my people that I would be flying to Germany on a special mission. I at once notified Captain Bernhardt by radio. I think I may be back in a week. Keep your courage up and see that as many men as possible get back to the Cape Bon Peninsula. Give my greetings to everyone. Next day, I packed the essentials. My main baggage, including the picture of Rommel, I left behind in my command car. In the afternoon, the Fieseler landed at our base. Its young pilot told me I had to be on the airfield at about 5.30 in the morning so that the Heinkel could cross the Mediterranean before Spitfires made the airspace unsafe. Then, several officers appeared from the Nizza battalion, which had been almost wiped out and had only one diminutive patrol fit for service that was still in action. They brought along a few bottles of Chianti and handed me letters and packets for their families in Italy, which I was to take with me. In the evening... We all squatted together under the palms. No sound of battle was to be heard. Everything appeared so peaceful and unreal. It was later than I would have wished. The pilot of the Fieseler had to wake me up. We were behind schedule. One last wave from the machine and we set off as dawn was breaking. The Heinkel was standing ready with engines running. The Fieseler taxied up to the entrance hatch. The pilot, apparently a very experienced sergeant, called out to me from the cockpit. Hurry, Major! Hurry! We're late! The Spitfires will soon be there. I had to lie flat in the nose cone and as front gunner, man the 20 Mimiton cannon. There was no other way of transporting me. Are you familiar with the cannon, Major? The pilot asked over the intercom. Listen, we had this gun in our scout cars when you were still wetting your pants, I replied. OK, try it out, please. As soon as we're over the sea, we shall be flying very low came the pilot's voice. The day was dawning in the east as we lifted off with engines roaring. After a few minutes, we were over the sea, about 30 to 50 feet, I guessed, above the surface of the water. 
So I put in a magazine, fed it through, and pressed the trigger. Nothing. I fed through again. Again, nothing. What kind of a stupid gun is this? I shouted to the pilot. I tried again and again and finally half dismantled the cannon. I fed through again. Again, nothing. The pilot was getting anxious. We need your gun in case British fighters attack from the front. Please keep trying. It's already light outside. I was now fully occupied with the bloody gun and saw nothing, where or how high we were flying, or whether British fighters might appear out of the blue. Suddenly the pilot drew the machine up. We're getting near Sicily, his voice came through. Soon be out of danger. I hardly heard him. I was too busy with the cannon. And suddenly it worked. A long burst of fire ripped through the skies. Hooray! I cried. It's working! Stop! Stop! shouted the pilot, and already the first salvos of flak were whistling past us. The Italian air defences took us for a Heinkel captured by the British. Luckily their aim was not very good. My pilot fired recognition flares. The Italians stopped firing, and we were able to land. Thanks for the flight, I called to the sergeant. Next time, I'll bring my own two millimeter cannon. That same day, I flew to Rome on a shuttle plane, was allotted a room in the famous Hotel Excelsior on the Via Veneto by the German liaison officer, and given an appointment with Kesselring for the following morning. Rome seemed almost undisturbed. There was no blackout. As in Germany, there were hardly any military vehicles to be seen, and the famous Via Veneto was pulsating with life as in times of peace. In my faded tropical uniform, I felt out of place. At the hotel, I gave the letters of my Italian friends to the porter, who at once congratulated me with great respect on the Medaglia d'Argento. After a bath, the first for so long, I decided to eat at Che Alfredo. Alfredo was famous for his spaghetti and had received from the Italian royal family a set of golden cutleries with which he himself served the great personalities of the day. The walls of his little restaurant on the Piazza Colonna were covered with the photographs and dedications of famous politicians, actors and writers. His Golden Visitor's Book offered a cross-section of the prominent from all the world. When Alfredo saw me, he rushed across to me. Comandante, what an honour and pleasure. Congratulations on the Medaglia d'Argento. I will serve you personally with the best spaghetti, which is still to be had here, in spite of the war. From all the tables, people looked across to me as Alfredo drew his golden cutlery from his pocket to serve the spaghetti. Then the climax. The lights went out. The head waiter brought a flaming omelette surprise to my table and Alfredo cried out in delight. Echo maestoso! There was applause from all the tables. I had to get a grip on myself. That morning, I had still been on the last battlefield in North Africa, now a ceremony here that had nothing whatever to do with war and death. I thank it, Alfredo. Wonderful first class. We could only dream of such things in North Africa. Now we'll cap the festive meal with a nice mocha. Alfredo almost wept. Comandante, there is a war on. We've had no coffee now for a long time. How sorry I am, this damned war. I put my hand in my pocket and took out a little packet of real coffee. Here, Don Alfredo, here's our mocha. It's for you, the chef, and a cup for me, OK? Alfredo's eyes shone. Shortly after, he invited me into the Holy of Holies, to the chef in his kitchen. There, the three of us sat at the chef's table and enjoyed the mocha, an honour for me to sit with the chef in person. I was not allowed to pay, but had to be entered in the Golden Visitor's Book, where my name now stood modestly beside that of so many prominent people. Relaxed and at peace, I strolled through the night up the Veneto to enjoy a bed again after so long. Next morning, a car from the liaison officer took me to Frascati, the wine centre near Rome, where Kesselring had his headquarter. There, time had stood quite still, not a trace of the war. It was already spring there, and surrounded by its vineyards, the romantic town nestled against a hill. I was admitted at once to Kesselring. He was apparently fully informed. 
He was a charming man of medium height with warm and sympathetic eyes. We respected him as he was the only high commander to come to Africa. How was the flight? he asked. Did Seidemann's Heinkel bring you safely over the pond? He had a good laugh when I told him the tale of the 20 limiter cannon. I haven't much hope of getting our plan through with Hitler, but we must try it, with the further signatures of Schmidt and Guderian. You can still fly to Berlin today, by courier plane. Every day counts. Good luck. And he shook my hand. Still in my dusty, faded tropical uniform, I landed in Berlin after sending off a report to von Armin from Frascati. What a contrast to Rome. The city presented a picture of destruction. Many of the houses were now just ruins, and the faces of the once busy Berliners were grey. One could see that they no longer believed in the final victory of Hitler and Goebbels, though no one dared say as much. The danger of denunciation was too great. That same evening, I was admitted to General Schmidt. He too was well briefed. Responsible for the personnel side of the evacuation measures, he signed the plan without even reading it. Next morning, I was with Colonel General Guderian, the newly appointed chief of the general staff of the army. I had not seen him since the beginning of the war. He looked tired. Only his eyes had their old sparkle. Luck, I'm glad to see one of the old hands of the Panzer Force again, alive and well. How many from the early days of our proud force have already gone? We've just lost Stalingrad. You know, perhaps, how many experienced officers and men have fallen there or been taken prisoner. And now the same thing is looming in Africa. I can't even think about the seasoned members of the three divisions of the old Africa Corps with their desert experience or the new divisions sent. That is why I agreed at once to the evacuation plan which had, of course, already been drawn up by Rommel, though we all had little hope that Hitler would agree to it. The idea of sending you to him, as an old trooper from the front, carries more weight, at any rate, than our opinion, which is regarded by Hitler as defeatist into Tunisia. You can still go today, by the night train, and be in Berchtesgaden tomorrow morning. Colonel General, one question before I leave. Why have you come back now, after Hitler had fired you? It's something we often ask ourselves. Listen, Guderian replied. If I had refused, as I would have much preferred, someone else would be sitting in my chair, who might have known nothing of Panzer tactics, or who might have been just a yes-man to Hitler's ideas. As it is, I can try to save what is to be saved, and make some attempt to prevent the worst from happening. There is now, more than ever, the threat of an invasion by the Western Allies in Italy or southern France or both. For that, I need an intact, experienced panzer force. Whatever I can do for all of you, I will do. Guderian then made a surprising request. Luck, you have very good relations with Rommel, haven't you? As I've not come across him for some years, I would be very interested in a talk with him. If you should meet Rommel at Führer headquarter or anywhere else, please ask him whether he would agree to a meeting, preferably in Munich. No one must know of it. Hitler would at once suspect a conspiracy, with dire consequences for us. You've caught my meaning? Of course, Colonel General. I'll do what I can and let you know. With his winning smile, he dismissed me. Once again, I sent off a radio message to von Arnim, and told him I would be visiting HQ the next day. Through a long night, I rolled south in a sleeping, undisturbed by air raids. The first person I met in Berchtesgaden was Lieutenant Colonel von Bonin, whom I had last seen on New Year's Eve 1942, when he accompanied Rommel to my command post in the desert. What are you doing here? He greeted me. I thought you were fighting your last battle in Tunisia. In confidence, I put him in the picture about my mission and asked through or via whom I could best get to make my plea to Hitler. My friend, he replied, we're not on the battlefield here. Here even Rommel has no say. Here, bureaucracy rules. That means you must first go to the officer in charge, Africa, a certain Colonel X, who will then announce you to Colonel General Jody. He will get the OK from Field Marshal Keitel as to whether and when you will be allowed in to see the Führer. Come, as a start, I'll take you to the first link in the chain of command, 
but from 1230 to 1400 hours there's the midday break, when no one at all can be seen. That's the way things are. In Africa, well over a hundred thousand men are bleeding and fighting for their lives. But here, the midday break must be observed, while the war comes to a stop. Colonel X received me in very friendly fashion. I stated my business and asked to be announced at once to Jody. Listen, my friend, you can forget about the evacuation plan. The North African theatre of war has already been virtually written off. We are still trying, of course, to send over as much material as possible to continue the struggle, but we have no great hopes. Be glad that you're out of the mess. Your mother will be thankful to see you again safe and sound. I was shocked. It was as easy as that, apparently. The theatre of war was simply written off. Have you any idea, I replied somewhat sharply, how things look down there, what we've been through, and that we are only losing the war because we have never received adequate supplies. Please arrange an appointment for me with Colonel General Jody for this afternoon. It was fixed for three o'clock. Over a meal in the bare mess, Bonin gave me Rommel's address and telephone number. Whatever happened, I wanted to tell him of the outcome. Then, with my large envelope, I was standing before Jody. We knew he was an experienced staff officer, but we frontline troops didn't like him as he was such a toady to Hitler. I explained my mission to him and why von Arnim had chosen me as intermediary. Things look very bad, Colonel General, I began. We're no longer equal to the pressure of the British and the Americans. The RF, in particular, hinders almost all our movements, except when it's raining. The long front from Gabes to Tunis cannot anywhere near be covered by us. To prevent a disaster as many men as possible should be evacuated at once, to be available on fronts where the Western Allies are sure to land. For this purpose, I have an evacuation plan to deliver, which has been carefully worked out by Rommel and von Arnim, and countersigned by Kesselring, Guderian and Schmidt. With that, I handed him the envelope. I have been sent here, I went on as an insignificant field officer in the hope that this would make some impression on the Führer. Jody looked at me for a long time without opening the envelope. Listen, Luck, he finally said. There is absolutely no question of evacuating elements of the Africa army or of considering a German Dunkirk, as you call it. The Führer is not ready to think of retreat. We won't even let you see him personally. He would have a fit of rage and throw you out. Besides, we're glad to have the Führer on the political tack for a few days, as he is just having a state visit by Antonescu of Romania. Without pausing, Jody took my arm and led me to a huge campaign map that covered one whole wall. Here, you can see the front in Russia when we were about to lose Stalingrad. What do you think about Stalingrad? Colonel General, we have so much trouble with our own theatre of war that we have no time to concern ourselves with Stalingrad. We merely ask ourselves whether it is necessary to abandon 200,000 battle-tried men to their fate. The word Stalingrad is, for us, a provocation, as we fear a similar fate, unless an attempt is made to save what is left to save. Jody was silent. After a short pause, he gave me his hand. I can understand you all, but your mission is of no avail inform von Arnim to that effect. When I left Jody, I saw in his eyes a helpless sympathy for the Africa army. Deeply disappointed, I went to the radio office and sent off my message to von Arnim. Not admitted to Führerer, plan rejected by Jody, flying back to Rome and from there to Tunisia. I reported my departure to Colonel X and met Bonin once more. Please tell Rommel about the failure of my mission I will try to fly back to Africa. If that proves impossible, I'll get in touch with Rommel, I told him. There was nothing more to keep me in Germany. I wanted to be with my men. In Rome, I was told by the German liaison officer that strict orders were in force to allow no further personnel to fly to Africa. Only supplies were to be flown to Tunis within the bounds of what was still possible. I didn't give up hope, however, of being able to get across I stayed for the time being in Rome and was at the liaison office every day. The daily news from the front was alarming. The Mareth position had been lost. 
but the remains of the Africa army were still holding out at Gabes and the 5th Panzer Army west and southwest of Tunis. The Americans failed to push into the huge gap between the two armies and thus separate them from each other. In the first half of April, it would still have been possible to move a large part of the troops to Sicily via the Cape Bon Peninsula and from north of Tunis. Earmarked for this were all the Junkers 52s, Auntie Jerfs, that were flying in supplies and flying out empty, torpedo boats, and the famous Siebel ferries, large flat ferries that were driven by old aircraft engines. But, apart from the wounded, no one was allowed to leave Tunisia. One day in April, I met with General Gauss in Rome. He had been sent to the Commando Supremo. I believe von Arnim wanted to save this seasoned general staff officer for Rommel and General Bayerlin, who was very ill. By the end of April, the front in the south was on the point of collapse. Hardly any ammunition, fuel or replacements were getting across. Suddenly, an order from Führer headquarter arrived in Rome. A start is to be made at once with the evacuation of German and Italian troops from Tunisia. All available means of transport are to be employed. And what followed was the very evacuation plan that I had delivered to Jody weeks before. Junkers, torpedo boats, and Siebel ferries were brought into action. My battalion was still in the south with the Africa army. It would have had no chance of getting through to the north to the Cape Bon Peninsula. I received a last radio message from Captain Bernhardt. Have no fuel or ammunition left. Immobile awaiting decisive attack. We greet our commander and our families. Panzer Reconnaissance Battalion 3. When the first officers and men arrived at the airfields for evacuation, American tanks were already there. Come on boys, it's all over, they informed our troops. Hands up. At headquarter, they had hesitated for over two weeks, only to attempt a German Dunkirk after all. Thousands could have been saved if Jody had authorised our plan at once. On 6th May, after an all-out offensive by the Allies, the German-Italian remains of the proud Africa army surrendered. More than 130,000 German soldiers went into captivity. To be taken prisoner has been regarded from time immemorial as a national or personal disgrace. Although humane treatment could have been expected from the British and Americans, many tried to avoid capture. A few succeeded in adventurous ways. Some members of the paratroop division got to Sicily by tying themselves to the undercarriage of the few overfilled Jew 52s. Lieutenant von Mutius from my battalion turned up in Rome. Since we had no reconnaissance vehicles or ammunition, he reported, I was with our supply section in the Cape Bon Peninsula. When everything was coming to an end, I happened to discover a Siebel ferry in a bay, intact and well camouflaged. Technicians established that the ferry was ready to start. I asked the men, wandering around aimlessly in the area, who would like to come to Sicily with me? Nearly a hundred came forward, with whom I set off before dawn. Sailing only by my compass, we reached a port in Sicily without interference. There we were not allowed to land because we had no ship's papers. All right then, I shouted to the Italians, we'll put to sea again. We came ashore in an unguarded bay. Here we are to rejoin our units. Lieutenant von Weckmar from my battalion, who, after the war, was a correspondent with the UP agency in Germany and is today our ambassador in London, years later, gave an account of his fate. During the final days, I was in action in the north. After the surrender, I cleared off with another officer and found an American jeep in which we tried to get through to Morocco. We had gotten no further than Algeria when we were discovered by the Americans and taken prisoner as we were trying to organise some fuel. Like almost all German prisoners, we were shipped to the USA, where I ended up in a POW camp in Trinidad, Colorado, and was well treated. Although, at the time, I much regretted falling into captivity, in retrospect, it may have saved my life. Winfried von St. Paul, the nephew of a good friend of mine, was transferred to my battalion at the end of 1942, at my request, and saw action with the successful Molinari patrol. Long after the war, I met him again in Hamburg. 
he told me of the last days of my battalion. Once, when we were still operating in the south of Tunisia, our patrol just managed to escape the British, though they did capture our little workshop vehicle. Next day, the vehicle turned up again. The crew reported that the British commander had said, We really can't leave you in the desert without spare parts or water. Here's some water, get back to your battalion. This was more evidence of fairness in this theatre of war. When you flew to Germany, St Paul told me, Captain Bernhardt took command. At the beginning of May 1943, we were still fighting in the southern sector. The battalion still had 90 men in action, but no scout cars and only a little fuel when, on 9th May, we had to surrender. The British officer, who took us prisoner, went up to Bernhardt and said, It's an honour for us to capture you and Reconnaissance Battalion 3. Please keep your pistol. Is there anything we can do for you? Please don't make us walk to Tunis, replied Bernhardt. We're tired. At that, British trucks were organised, which took us to the prison camp, past prisoners marching on foot, including a general. From Constantine, St Paul went on, we were taken by train to Casablanca, guarded by Americans with wooden truncheons. We aren't dogs. We called out to them, put the truncheons away. From then on, we were well treated and came into conversation with the guards. As we travelled west, we passed huge dumps of fuel and ammunition, as large as football fields. Our opinion was unanimous. With all this material, we never had a chance of winning the war. In the POW camp at Opelika, Alabama, in the States, we were treated really well until we were discharged at the beginning of April 1946, unfortunately, to England, where it was another year before we were sent home. All the accounts that I heard, some still in Rome, others long after the war, traced the sad end of a merciless but always fair war in North Africa. While everyone in Rome was already speculating about whether and where the Allies would land in Italy, the African chapter had also ended for me. My thoughts went out to my brave men across the sea, for whom the war had ended for good.